Hi, my name's Paul Hopewell. Welcome back to my shed. In this video, I want to show you what I did to fix the excessive end float on the apron worm. To say that the worm bushes were a bit worn would be a bit of an understatement. There are three ways of sorting this problem. One, replace the worn items with new ones. Two, remove the setting pins, adjust the end play and drill new pin holes. Three, make shims. No prizes for guessing what I chose to do. The retaining collars appear to have buried themselves into the ends of both bushes. To find out what's going on, I need to take them apart to have a good look at them. To prevent each of the retaining collars from moving after they're first assembled, the collars are locked into a fully set position with a roll pin or a spring pin through one side of each collar into one side of the worm body. One assumes that when excess play rears its ugly head, one would simply knock the pin out, make the necessary adjustment, drill a new hole through and then replace the pin. Job done. I understand the pin can be removed in one of two ways using the right size drift. By driving the pin into the worm or by driving the pin outward from the bore of the worm. I chose the latter so as not to lose the pin and because as soon as the pin clears the worm body the collar is easier to rotate having something on the outside of a round collar to provide some purchase assistance, especially if your hands are as slippy as an eel in a bucket of chip oil. I know these collars have been off before because of the chisel marks on the outside of one of these collars. The marks indicate that the pin did its job until the assailant ran out of breath and found the reason it wouldn't budge. Having extracted one collar and one bush, the amount of wear is plainly obvious. The collar has worn itself into the body of the bush to a depth of about one and a half millimetres, that's about 60 thou. It's not only producing an unacceptable amount of end float, but also removing the oil groove in the process. Mind you, I don't think the lack of a full depth of oil groove in this case is going to cause anything to seize up or mar. With the rear collar and bush removed, the worm simply slides through the support housing. On a side note, both bushes still fit comfortably well on each end of the worm. The front collar, that'll be the one nearest the chop by the way, is also showing signs of wear of about 1mm depth or 40 thou deep. What I needed to do first was to remove the step from the outside edge of both bushes and recut the oil ways on those faces. I could turn them off or use the belt sander, but just to be awkward I decided to use the diamond roughing block at 200 grade. That should enable me to sneak up to the side face without ripping my fingers off or having the hard material slip in the lathe chuck. Sometimes I do make some really silly choices. Anyway, after removing the excess from the bushes, I reassembled the worm and relocated the collar pins. The pins only allow the collars to be set in one position, and that's in the original position on the worm body. I then used feelers to define the thickness of the shim I needed to remove the excess end play, which just happened to be 2.5mm, that's about 100 thou. The material I used was medium carbon steel that I had spare from making steering bushes in one of my very first videos. This material lends itself to hardening quite readily. I set the material in the three jaw chuck with the outside jaws fitted. The first task is to clean the material up after checking that it was fully seated in the jaws. I later used this face to set the parting off tool position.
To get it to size meant I had to remove a bit of excess material before chamfering both corners. I know the boring bar was sticking out a bit further than was really necessary, but the bore was open limits anyway, so so long as they weren't fitted, it, it'll do. The parted off shim needed to be 2.5mm thick, and just for good measure I cut it to just under 3mm thick to leave me enough room to grind off the excess. Before going over to the grinder, I hardened the material and then de-stressed it by putting it in the oven for a couple of hours at gas mark 7 for two hours. The kitchen will not smell bad for too long, I hope. On the first few passes with the surface grinder, I allowed the residual magnetic force of the grinding table to hold the part while I skimmed the top face. Then I turned it over on full power to clean up the second side before eventually turning the workpiece back over to finish it to size. One has to be very careful and take very light cuts when using residual magnetic attraction, That's, that is the table is switched off, because the part can very easily let go and smack you in the chops and that's the last thing in the world you want. I guarantee you it's not easy drinking beer with two holes in your face. After reassembling the whole unit to check the fit again, I disassembled it again, this time to get the oil slots cut into the two bushes over on the mill. When I said oil slots, I mean only the slots on the side face, not the ones in the bore. The bore's fine. These little slots are to allow a little oil to drizzle on the collar faces, so all I need to do was clean out a bit of material to allow the wick to do its job. This allowed the milling process to be a simple one. I know the apron looks as though it's almost complete at this part of the video. Ignore that. I'm actually further on with the rebuild than I've led you to believe. This is just to show you what I went through to get this part of the rebuild process done. The wick, as I've already pointed out, is a bit of heat proofing from the inside of an oven mitt. That reminds me, I've got to go buy some oven mitts very soon. Anyway, I tested this material in a glass of oil before I used it to see how high the wicking would draw. It managed to wick to almost 40 millimeters, and to me that was impressive. Anyway, I cut this material into long strips and doused it in oil before wrapping it around and behind the clutch basket. That's before shoving it inside the two bushes. Mind you, getting the wick to behave itself is a bit like trying to get water to run uphill. One thing I did notice when I started to dismantle this apron was that I found the wick in the bottom of the oil sump. And there wasn't any oil in the sump either, only grease. How the grease got in there is beyond me because the oil tubes were still letting the oil through. That said, the oil cover was loose and oil would just have run straight out. I know one thing for sure, that when it goes back together the oil pan will be that well sealed you'll be able to float the saddle on a pond. Still, it's done now and I'm a happy chap. That's all for now, thanks for watching. Bye for now.